everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and welcome to the channel. I'm super excited to have a very special interview with my literary agent, Ilana Roth Parker. You guys submitted a ton of questions, and I'm going to go through as many of them as I can with Ilana. And first, before we do that, I'm going to let her formally introduce herself. So who are you? What's your life story? Hi. Well, <laughs> my whole life story would take too long, but I'm Ilana Roth Parker. I am Alexa's agent. Um, I've been a literary agent for 12 years, if I'm doing the math right, right now. Um, I've been in children's publishing longer than that, but five years longer than that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, almost two decades, I guess. That's a pretty, it's a pretty long haul. Um, I've always specialized in children's books, picture book through YA since I started working. Uh, my first job was at a book packager doing children's books exclusively. So I've just kind of stayed in, stayed in that side of the publishing industry since then. After 17 years in New York, where I got this whole career started, I left about four years ago. I lived back in Michigan with my family, um, which is super nice in a pandemic not to be in New York City. So that's my bonus right now. Um, <laughs> you yeah. look at the silver line. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh, and mostly I'm just focusing on my my list of clients and trying to find new commercial leaning, but like engrossing escapist kind of fiction. That's where my heart lies. You've always loved escapist fiction. So oh, like yeah. nothing changed for you. No, it's, it helps a lot. It helps a lot not to um, have to change my reading style too much in these times. Although my concentration has obviously shifted quite a bit. Well, to get started, you, you yeah. touched on it that you started at a book packager. Yeah. I got probably 10 to 15 questions that were all, how do you get started as an agent? What was your major in college? What's your advice to people who want to be an agent? So could you talk about that a little? Yeah. I mean, I, I became an agent by accident. Like it really wasn't where I set off to be and you know being an agent's also kind of like it's a long journey and i've done other things in tangent with this journey like it's not just this one thing um long story short like i mean it's not a surprise i was an english major in college um i didn't know what i wanted to do until like junior senior year and even then i was like i didn't really know where i was going to end up like i was kind of that nerdy person who was like editing yearbooks and newsletters on campus and i was good at writing papers and analyzing books like i like to read so um but for me i was in new york so i was like oh i'm in new york there's got to be some cool internships so that's really where i was just like i applied for anything that looked interesting. Um, I like applied to the MoMA, I applied to Condé Nast, I applied to, you know, like magazines, publishing houses, like anything. And actually it was Nickelodeon Magazine that was like, I lucked out on that one. Um, and that really was the thing, like the aha moment of, oh, making stuff for kids is really awesome. And it was a magazine, it was much more, you know, it was a funny group of artists and editors. They were the like, I'm still in touch with a good chunk of them today. Um, even though it's just like an intern for a year, like they're so great and they love their jobs. And it made you realize that like people who enjoy the content they're creating is like, that was a real wake up call for me. So that's what really turned me on to children's stuff. I mean, it didn't hurt that like I was a child of Nickelodeon. Um, yeah you know, I watched all those shows. And like when I was working there, every single friend was like, so do you carry the bucket of slime around the office? <laughs> like, not really, but yes, it was like all SpongeBob all the time, but it yeah. was fun too. Like they also did a lot of creative research projects and just like writing funny things for kids. So that's really what, where I was leaning. And accidentally also, it's how I got my job. Like I, you know, I did the thing that a lot of people do, which is, you know, it's not like advice I can give because it was clearly a case of white girl privilege where I got to like make a lot of phone calls based on my parents, friends and who, who knew who and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But three very long string of connections, someone knew R.L. Stein. Hmm. And I love this story. So. Yeah. Cause he was like a nice Jewish guy from Columbus, Ohio. And like, we're nice Jewish people from Detroit, Michigan. And that's not that far away. So, you know, it was like a friend of a friend of a friend. And like, all of a sudden I'm skipping class one day, my senior year spring semester to like make a call to some guy, my dad called Bob Stein. I was like, you mean RL Stein? He was like, yeah, do you know him? I was like, yeah, he wrote like 85 Goosebumps books. Like he's one of the best selling children. I love I know. I never read because I don't do scary, but 
Um, I was like, okay. And I was like, but he can't, I was just calling cause I, the phone call got set up and he's like, well, I can't give you a job. I was like, I know, but thank you so much for your time. And he said, he was interested that I was working at Nickelodeon cause he was the first editor they hired at Nickelodeon before, like he did the first, ep, the first issue. Um, and then they fired him and he was like, I got fired from there, but it was great. You should, that's awesome. Um, he's like, I can't give you a job, but my editor is looking for an assistant. So why don't you give her a call? So nice. I called Susan Lurie and she was, her assistant was leaving. And so I went in and interviewed and that's kind of how I landed there. And I was there for five years. Um, it was lovely. I learned a ton. Um, mm-hmm. And agenting kind of happened after those five years. Like we were doing a lot of licensing work. So working with brands like John Deere Tractors and Mary Kate and Ashley Olson and Thomas Kincaid Paintings, like not stuff that was my life passion, but was interesting and a, a range of ages and book products. Um, but we started to do more original proposals and we're looking for writers. So I had to start calling agencies and see if any writers were looking to do work for hire. Um, and it, through that exploration, I was like, oh, well that might be a really interesting job to be the person who's working directly with the authors and selling their books to publishers. So yeah. that's how I got connected on that end and then I made the switch. Uh, and if you were talking to a teen right now, someone who's either in high school or currently in college who has the goal of being an agent, what advice would you give to them? I mean, being an agent is tricky because it's not, there's not a degree you need for it. There's not even a resume you really need for it. Like most people who become agents either start out as another agent's assistant, like it's an apprenticeship based career where like you go work for an agency and you read for them and you write reports and you do their grunt work. And then gradually you'd be able to take on your own clients. Um, and then, or you are in some other part of the industry and you transfer to this side. Like there's a lot of editors or marketers or people who have done publicity, even like a lot of publicists actually make really great agents because they it's, know what sells. it's a connection job too. Like you have to be able to talk to people, know who's good for what. So, you know, sometimes you get people who have been in one track of the business for a long time and for, you know, for various reasons, layoffs, you know, or just creative stretching, um, they switch in, but there's not, you don't have to be in a certain place. You don't have to have a certain degree you know, like I know agents who have no college degree, who just have always been voracious readers or got involved in online community forums and just knew parts of the industry really well, like romance or something, you know, like parts where there's like big, huge communities and they can really like tap into something and understand it. Um, And people who are just fear, like are good at talking to people and making connections and going from there. So there's a lot of ways into it. It's not necessarily a career I would recommend for a younger person right away, unless you can end up in a salaried job. Because most, well, not most, well, a good chunk of agents work on commission. Um, so it's the kind of job where you don't make any money for like years and then you have to build up a list and those books have to start selling for you to be able to do it. Um, if you can find a salaried position as an assistant or doing um, subrights tracks or subrights or, you know, like one of the divisions of an agency that, is steady and they can pay you for it. Like that's a good way to go, but it's not necessarily something I would recommend right off the bat because it's a financial gamble. Um, And especially obviously like we're living in very uncertain times and I don't recommend uncertainty for anybody if they can help it (laughs) right now. Yeah. If they, you know, Um, I mean, likewise, like the side question is, well, then how do you get into publishing? And it's kind of the same answer. Like it's a very apprentice based industry. It's, you don't need, you don't need an MBA. You don't need a master's. You don't need to spend a lot of money. Although it does because of the locations of publishing that makes it tricky because so much of it is New York based. Yeah. Um, and that's hard. But the, I mean, I think it's just a matter of like, making connections, finding people, you know, being a strong reader. You don't have to be a writer to do this job, but you need to be a very, you know, sharp, incisive reader, someone who can like see the bigger picture and book by book, Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes almost better if you're not a writer because there are many authors who won't sign your agent to also write books. 
I don't know how those people do it. I don't know how the editors who are also authors do it. Like, I don't know. The the brain space it takes to write your own books. Yeah. I, I don't personally think doesn't leave a lot of room for other books. I don't know how people with day jobs do it either, even though most of my clients have day jobs. I'm you just know, tired. I, yeah, well, it's like a whole different. Yeah. Experience. Yeah. Um, actually, on the subject, uh, I know there's no typical day in the life or week in the life of an agent, no. but I also know that it's not completely clear what agents actually do. So what's kind of a brief yeah. overview of all the stuff you do? Because you <laughs> wear a ton of different hats. There are a lot of different skill sets yeah. you have to have as an agent. Yeah. I mean, like you said, it's not a typical, there's no typical day and I'm very, it's very cyclical business. So, you know, a lot of it just starts with reading. Like, I, you know, it's a lot of it's culling through material to find things that are going to be worth taking on. And then once you have a list of clients, you have projects that are in various levels of management. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I have some clients who are under contract and my job there is to check in with them and making sure they're meeting delivery dates, checking in with their editors to make sure they're making payments when they're supposed to, you know, just kind of keeping track on the stuff that's like now on a schedule. Um, so that's one kind of management that happens. And that's, that's a little bit more predictable because once there's paperwork and a contract and dates, then I know when the triggers are and I can put them into my calendar and figure yeah. out when I need to follow up with so-and-so about that, that payment um, or make sure the cover is coming or ask them for the marketing plan for the 20th time or whatever. Then there's a lot of client editorial work. So clients, you know, will send me material in varying stages of completeness to give them a reaction to, to edit, to get ready for submission. Um, so that, you know, I, I generally have a couple clients and, you know, with stuff on my docket that I have to review. Um, sometimes it's a proposal, sometimes it's a picture book manuscript, like whatever, like there's just different things that need feedback. There's contract review that happens now that depends on how much deal making I'm doing. So, you know, a contract review when that comes in, like that's a good 20 page dense document from a publisher that needs a, a couple uninterrupted hours for me to read just to make sure like the deal points are correct on and then review it against our you know, against another contract that we already have with that same publisher to make sure that they didn't mess with anything or to see places I want to improve it that maybe we didn't get the last time. So there's that. I actually really like the contracts. I know that's weird. Which is good. I like it. That's yeah. And, really good at bat for us. Yeah. Um, I let, my boss, Laura, is really good at them too. So, and she's always happy to read a contract, even if it's not her client. So she and I are like, we'll always go back and forth on contracts and it's always an opportunity to make an improvement. Like it's, you don't have to take anything. And then, you know, there's checking There's like meeting editors and reaching out to people I haven't sold to before and just keeping an eye on industry news and, you know, looking mm -hmm. at the listings that come up and just keeping an ear to the ground on what's working, what's not working, what people are selling. There's that. Um, and then reading query letters, you know, the, I get a couple hundred a month, which is a lot, you know, a hundred a week. That's a lot. I read them all myself. Like I don't farm that out to an intern or an assistant. Like I don't trust, <laughs> I've never learned to train anybody well enough to read my queries for me. Yeah. Um, so like every couple of days I go through and try and get a batch out so that I'm not too far behind. So there's that. And then there's reading submissions on stuff I have requested. So that doesn't tend to be a daytime activity so much. Um, I will take an hour or two sometimes during the day to like get lunch and read manuscripts to have free space. But when I'm at my desk, like that's really the time I have to edit client work. Yeah. Get some of that done. Um, so it's a variety of subjects at the moment. I don't have much on submission. Um, since everyone was like kind of sold near the beginning of the year. So I'm not, I don't have too much to follow up on with that stuff right now, which is, you know, a pandemic was going to happen in my work cycle. It's not the worst time for that to be happening. And I'm also like checking in with my coworkers a lot because, you know, I've got, we've got a foreign rights person, an audio person. So, you know, we're just kind of, you know, they're asking questions, just getting stuff sorted out. Yeah. And honestly, like a lot of my job is just kind of keeping up with the, the industry and the shifts and, you know, all how, markets are doing across the world like what amazon's doing about that, so. you know, like, yeah i mean it's tricky like there's just a lot of changes and a lot a lot to think about 
So just generally, I would love to know for you, since you specialize in kid lit, what makes a great YA novel versus what makes a great middle grade novel and then picture book? Because I got lots of different questions about how do you know that a YA novel is good? And yeah, it's broad but specific. Like for you personally, what are you what are you looking for in those categories? Um, what am I looking for? So those are different questions, right? Like what makes yeah. something good versus what makes something great versus what I'm looking for. Um, because obviously there are things I think are great that wouldn't be great for every reader. Um, so that's a that's I guess I'll just talk about me because uh, that's the easiest way <laughs> to just not speak for other people. Okay, so for me a great middle grade and a great YA. I mean, there are differences between the two of them, obviously, and that might be part of what the question is that's being asked. But I look for books that are, get me out of my life experience and into something else. Mm -hmm. um, for middle grade, I tend to like things that are more funny, madcap adventure -y, things that are like a fun just something that a kid can really like laugh at and enjoy the slapstick escapades or, you know, it can be a space adventure. It can be fantastic creatures. It can be something realistic too. I like a good, funny, realistic novel, but things really like kids are really being kids and they're a little bit in control of their destinies in a fun way. And mm -hmm. it's an enjoyable experience. Like that's where I fall on a middle grade and voice is really I know that's a question that'll come up at some point here too. And it's it, a harder question. It came up many times and it's so hard to talk about voice. It's very yeah. hard to talk about voice. Um, middle grade voice, middle grade lives or die by, dies by the voice. Um, and I think that's because most people don't remember what they sounded like when they were 10 years old. Like I think most writers, even good ones, like I think we start to form into our more current personas in high school and in college. And I think when people write younger, that's about as far back as most people can go. Yeah. Um, which is why I also think we see more YA than we do middle grade. I also think most people's traumas are in YA and that we kind of always, our lives kind of always come back to our traumas in some way. And like high school is such a crucible for most people that like that's it's more appealing because we're always sort of trying to process like, why were we that way then? Like, what could we have done differently is, you know, if a magic fairy had showed up at that time, would that have saved all of our problems, et cetera. Um, middle grade is a little more innocent, but at the same time, there's a lot of humor and, you know, sarcasm and smarts and like the kids are really interesting at that age, but I think it's hard for authors to remember what they sounded like at that age or what an authentic kid is at that age because they can yeah. get you can feel it when there's an adult stiltedness to it mm -hmm. um so it's it's a tricky tricky thing uh and so that's I, I tend to gravitate towards a certain kind of middle grade myself it might be because of my years at parachute working on more of that goosebumpsy type stuff which i know is scary but has a strong middle grade active kids component um mm -hmm. so i tend to go back into that bucket for my own middle grade um for YA, I have more of a range. Like I have a range of fluffy to darker, but at the same time, it's all very much a complete get me out of my experience mm -hmm. kind of read, like very escapist. I'm looking for things that have a bit of a fantastical element to them, which doesn't mean magic and fantasy. It just means there's like lowercase f fantasy, like something you can imagine, like something that's fun for you to get out. So it can be like, a murder mystery set in an Ivy League, you know, kids that are gearing up for the Ivy Leagues, or it can be, you know, a dis light dystopian romance thing. Like it can be anything in that camp, but it's something that's different from your experience. Mm -hmm. That's fun to be in and sweeps you up and just gets you, gets you out of your own headspace for 200 pages, 300 pages. So that's mostly what I look for. I like things that know where they came from. I like things that um, know how to reinvent the wheel a little bit like things that I, I do a lot of retellings and mashups of classics um, partially just because I like the kinds of authors who read like it's people who really grew up with a strong heritage internal heritage of reading and know mm -hmm. how to like take those stories and like you know shuffle the deck into something new and exciting um, like most literally I have a book on my list that's like it's like a collage of fairy tales, you know. Mm -hmm. It's 
and it's just it's interesting it's fun you know like i i yeah. can't um uh, yeah like that's just kind of what i t i gravitate towards and partially it's because i was an english major like yeah you know the unspoken part of my bio is that i also have a degree in bible like i like old books like i read you know it's like you can't go farther back than those stories so anyone who's got a strong lineage within their creative bones of like where books come from and what stories have told been told before them like i think those yeah. people are better writers because you have to be a reader to be a writer yeah like you can't you have to be my favorite english professor I in college always used to say that she said you know, if you want to be a writer, read, 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 read. Like you just have to read because the more you ingest, the more you understand what's good, the more you can innovate yeah. on it in your own way. So that's yeah. kind of what works for me. Picture book is a different story. I, because I tend to only work with author illustrators, um, mm -hmm. it's an art style thing, you know, and also just a sensibility thing. I like things that are a little funny, but also can have like a strong, like I don't like things that are overly saccharine and sweet, like mommy loves you kind of stuff, but, I do like something that speaks to a clear emotion that kids go through. Mm -hmm. um, I like cute, you know, cute stuff too. Like things that like a really cute character, like that skews a little bit more towards like a, a cartoonish vibe, mm -hmm. but without being too, not that kind of cartoony, but it, that's, I'm a little, my, that part of my list is much smaller. So it's hard to generalize. Yeah. Cause there's not as much to choose between. Like when I, when I fall in love with someone who's a really good artist and, and has a good idea for a story, like that's, yeah. I want them on my list. So, yeah. I actually did get questions about picture books and specifically okay. advice for author illustrators. So what is your advice for an author illustrator? Who's I mean, author illustrators should absolutely have a really good website portfolio. Um, that's, that's like shows a breadth of your work. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to be published first, like just as long as you're showing your best pieces that speak to the kinds of books you want to be illustrating. Um, is always good. Um, I mean, I would say most agents who are looking for picture books are looking for author illustrators. So mm -hmm. they're in short supply in a lot of ways, you know, like art yeah. is, I mean, I'm not an artist. Like I do crafty art projects with my children and I can, you know, but I'm not an artist. So it's like the number, the kind of talent it takes to hone those skills is even is so different. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, like it just query the regular ways. Like you're you're not doing anything different. Like it's I think it's a hard thing to do. I think wearing both the hat of author and illustrator is really tricky. Um because not everyone who can draw a picture can also craft a story. And picture books are really hard to write because they're very short and very condensed. Mm -hmm. And you you know, it's a lot harder to write a four hundred word story that's complete. Yeah. And People don't get that. Like, that's a misconception. I when I used to be more on the writing conference circuit, like I would be in front of the room giving my talk, and I'd be like, "Okay, how many people in this room are writing picture books?" And seventy-five percent of the room would raise their hands. And you would talk to people, and like most people would be like, "Oh, well, my last kid went off to college, and I realized I really wanted to write children's books." And it's like, okay, you know that's fine, but it's so, so, so hard to write something short that's universal, that's accessible, that generates ideas for art. So, you know, I, I usually gently discourage people away from them as po if possible. The people who are good are good and like they have a clear identity and they have a clear um, style mm -hmm. and they know how to do it, but even they'll tell you it's really hard. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know, I would just like, practice your art, you know, like people who want to be illustrators, like you have to also look at a lot of books and like see the range of styles that are working these days and, you know, see if you fit in. Generally speaking, what qualities do you look for in a writer that you want to represent for your list? Is is there like a common <laughs> <thread>? <laughs> Um, And this isn't just about my ego. <laughs> no, I, you know, like largely I'm looking for people who are collaborative and, rational and um, team players, because this is not an isolated industry. Like this relationship is one thing, but then I have to like give you to somebody else to work with and then you trust, trust that I'm not gonna run my mouth 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 with that person. And not that's not always a guarantee, you know, like that's, that's really tricky. Like some clients require way more management on that level, more um, pass interference. Uh, 
I kind of like people I like to talk to, you know, like it's because it's such a personal relationship and there's so much time involved in it. Like it's a real bonus to have someone that you are happy to hop on the phone with and chat with for an hour. But I mean, that's not a requisite. Like I have a lot of clients who aren't that way. Like they just, they're quiet. They're, they do their thing. They send me projects by email and like, it's always nice to talk to them, but like we don't have to, you know, do this all the time. Um, but most of the people who are just like, open and communicative but have a clear vision and know who they are and what kinds of stories they want to tell and you know it, it takes a certain amount of um grit and identity like a brand identity in a way like i don't mean that in like a tim gun heidi klum tv show kind of way i'm watching the new fake project runway on amazon yeah. fake project runway is a great name for it um and it, so it's not like brand like that you know what i mean but i think you writers who have a strong sense of what they what is a them book and what they want to accomplish it's mm -hmm. better because then they're not second guessing everything that comes in all the time because it's an easy you know like it's it's easy to doubt yourself based on notes you get from people um and i'm it's it hurts because like you can it's a book is so personal that like you write something and then hand it over to somebody and like what if they hate it um, and that can be you know i can only like that's just it's a very vulnerable experience but if you're someone who's like well this actually here's what i'm trying to accomplish here and i really want to do it like that's always very helpful because then having a backbone like allows us to interface better about how to get through the editorial notes i mean like okay well if that's what you're going for here's what i'm not getting okay can you know like like finding someone yeah. who who's got a strong identity that I can also like help shape, you know, like it's, but I don't want someone who's just trying to make me happy all the time. That, that can get right. really dangerous, especially when right. it comes to developing new projects. People are right. always asking like, you know, how much they should ask their agent to approve or not approve what they write. Yeah. And I, I, you're not prescriptive, which no. I like. <laughs> I don't want to be prescriptive either. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, I have a few clients who have a harder time with that because there's always a fear of what's going to sell in the market. And I get that. Like it, it would be, I can only, I can imagine it'd be very devastating and just an energy suck to like write something that you love and know that there's never a place for it or you have to wait three years for the market to turn around and that sucks. But like, I'm not going to tell you your book needs to be X, Y, or Z in order for me to sell it right now. Like, yeah. I really strongly feel that like the best book will come out, come from an author who's really wants to write that book and have, you know, they're, they're in it. Like their creative juices are in it. And like, that's where their focus is and great stuff sells, even if the market's whatever, you know, like, mm -hmm. like they're, you know, an agent colleague always says like, there's always a market for awesome, yeah. you know? So that's like, I don't want to, I never want to tell somebody yes, no, yes, no about elements of their book. I can be like, this might be a little more challenging, but do you feel strongly about it? Go for it. But you I need said that to me. Yeah. Like I need <laughs> some commitment. Yeah. You know, well, it's like, all execution. Like yeah. some books you can't tell from a pitch. You do have to write it. So. Right. And like, I have a few clients that pitch me a little bit more frequently and I'm always like, okay, but write it and tell me if you want to do it. I won't know yeah. until I read the thing. And even if I read the thing and give you notes on it, like you have to be like, okay, well, I'm still going to do this. You know, like it's, yeah. it, it's, it's tricky. So I'm not prescriptive, but you know, I like people who have a sense of themselves and what they're trying to do and their heart is in it. So it's mostly just like, I'm not the boss, you know, that's something I wish people knew about the author agent relationship is like, I'm not the What's boss. One of my questions. So there you go. Yeah. We'll answer that one there. I'm not the <laughs> boss. Like I, I am the agent, like agent means I act on your behalf, right? Like I am the person with the contacts and the knowledge base about the contracts and making those connections happen and doing the strategizing, but like, I can't make decisions for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Like you were still the driver of the car, you know? Well, I'm driving the car, but you're like backseat driving me. Like, I, you know, but allowed me to make decisions not yeah. to cross into tra traffic dangerously and stuff like that, you know? to take the metaphor too far. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's why it has to be a really communicative relationship where like you trust me to do what I'm doing. And at the same time, like you have a clear sense of what the books are and what you wanna do with them. So, yeah. and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of range and variety in there and there's a lot of opportunity. Like there's no one path, there's no one career, there's no one, there's no one author agent relationship. Like, 
and pretty open. But that said, so that that's kind of like what you look for in a client, but it all starts with the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have a range of questions about like your thought process essentially <laughs> when you're reviewing books. Uh, I'll start, let's, let's start with queries and work our way up to how you know you want to offer on a project. So okay. with queries, well, I got multiple people asking, what's an auto reject if you see something in a query? But then also, how do you know when you're reading a query that it's a really good query and that you want to request a book? So that's hard. Like, you know, the queries really, really range in capability. Mm -hmm. um, email and the internet blew the lid off of some of the natural filters that occurred Mm -hmm. writing before because it's like free everyone's got a keyboard and anyone can type into a, a box and yeah. send things to somebody else to look at so i have gotten to the point where volume is up because i think people just they have an email address and they're going to hit send and it's like whether it's ready or not or it's good or not and then it's in my box and i have to answer it so i do kind of auto filter based on it will seem superficial but it's actually quite helpful like people who don't have a clear command of the English language hmm. grammar or readability. Like mm -hmm. you can tell right away who the people are that understand how paragraphs are supposed to look, mm -hmm. how punctuation functions and how, yeah. you know, just those are, they seem really basic, but you'd be surprised how bad things can look in yeah. the series. And I am not going to read 400 pages of, a book that doesn't know what a paragraph looks like. It's just not going to happen. So there's that. So there's an easy screening process that I do right away. Like I can like skim it and not get too much into the content and understand that this person's not ready to write a book. Yeah. Like they're not there yet in their skill set. They don't have the, the basic tools. Like, yeah. So that's, that's one auto reject. Second auto reject is clearly things that are not in my categories. Like I still get a lot of queries for adult genres <laughs> that I don't represent. You know, <laughs> all kinds like nonfiction, prescriptive nonfiction, memoir. Like, I don't do that. Like, right. there's a difference for me between clients wanting to branch out and me signing new people in those areas. Yeah. Right? Like, that's a huge, that's a different ballgame. So, yeah. you know, my list is small enough. I'm not, I'm not going to learn on somebody like that, you know, right now. Like, that's not where my focus is. If I'm going to do it, it's going to be much more careful and strategic and, you know, whatever else. Also, I'm much more likely to do it for someone who's writing I already know and love than I am for somebody who's brand new. I mean, I read adult fiction, I read adult books, but like, that's just not my bread and butter. It's not, you know, where I am right away. So there's, those are auto rejects. And then there's stuff where I just know that the story is not going to be for me. Like I legitimately read a lot of good query letters yeah. where I'm like, this is a well-written letter and the sample pages look good but I'm not the person for this project. And I feel terrible rejecting those because I don't want it to send the, I don't want to send it to message to that person. This isn't worthwhile, but like yeah. my, my auto reject, I have a, like I, I have a form letter because I don't have time to personalize. I mean, I put everyone's name on, like I always make yeah. sure their name is in the, the rejection. Cause I mean, a lot of, you still actually respond to people. So I you're doing everybody and I put their name in. Yeah, I read the letters and I put their name in and I spell yeah. their names right even when they don't spell my name right. So I'm just going to say that. I mean, yeah. not spelling my name right is not an auto reject, by the way. It's not great and I'm not excited, but it, I have requested things where they call me Elena. Um, oh, sorry. All the time. I, I addressed you as uh, Miss Roth Parker. I which believe. is fine. Like, I'm not picky. Like, I'm not an asshole. But still, like it says this project is not for me in my letter. Yeah. Like, and I genuinely mean that because that's the most broad way and specific way I can say to reject people. So for me, I don't like books that are full of suffering for the sake of mm -hmm. suffering. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. I don't, a hard one for me right now is query letters. And there's a lot of them where it opens up and it's like, my brother has just died or four months after my parents were killed in a car accident. Like I have a yeah. really, that's not where I want to start my experience most of the time, which isn't to say there might not be tragedy in the character's past, but like so many YA books come in on the yeah. heels of a loss. Mm -hmm. and I already know that that's probably not where I am. You know, yeah. like, I'm looking for something more, like I said before, escapist and like launch me out of my experience, but I don't want to be sad already when the books start. Yeah. Like sad things happen in books. Like 
bad things happen in books. Like there has to be something on the line. There have to be stakes. That's cool. But I'm already, I'm not there for that. Like I'm not generally a problem novel kind of person either. Mm -hmm. um, when there's a lot of like rehab or drug problems or teen pregnancy or whatever, like all those things might play into a story, but like, I'm not there for a book that's solely about the that, thing. that kind of yeah. thing. Like, I'm really looking for things a little bit more upmarket, a little more get me out of Dodge, you know, like I'm just not, there, there a lot of agents do like those kinds of books and that's great. But that's why I say it's just a project that's not right for me. Yeah. Um, so those things tend to be careful rejections because you see a lot of talent and you're like, okay, there is something good here, but it's just like, I'm just wrong. Like, that's yeah. okay. I also have only 20 clients. Like, yeah. Like I think how many clients do I sign a year? Maybe we're, we're up to 20. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think 20, maybe 21, like, yeah. I mean, I sign maybe two people a year. Max. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. max now, because like, that means I'm adding, like, I haven't, I'm not, I don't have anybody on my list that I want to get rid of. Like, <laughs> you can tell me it's okay. <laughs> I really don't. Like I look down at all the time. I have some people that are yeah. just inactive or like yeah. have been drafting for three years, but like, I'll wait for them to write me, send me a book. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and I just want everyone watching this to know, like, Alana's ridiculously loyal. Like, people yeah. people worry about agents all the time. Like, there are agents out there who, like, they let you take your time, and it's not about rushing you to write things. And, like, you're, you're good people. Yeah, I mean, I, I know, like, there are definitely agents out there who are, like, looking at, oh, this person hasn't given me a book in three or four years. I'll just let them go. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, my list is so small that I generally know that those people, I know what's going on in their lives, that that's the case. Yeah. And they're fine. You know, like, it's okay. You know, like, yeah. that's, that's how it goes. Some people need time and they go away and they come back and whatever. Um, yeah. So I only sign a couple of people a year. So the truth is like most, re most things end up getting rejected. Like that's just really yeah. hard. You know, I try and be, my thing is like, I really do believe in the revise and resubmit. Like I actually have a lot of clients who find a lot of people, a lot that. of revise and resubmit people on my list. Um, that's actually a great sign. Like if I can give somebody some rough notes about what I liked about it and what wasn't working and it comes back yeah. and it's good, like that person's worth investing in, you know? So I do have quite a few people like that. Um, and I try and be generous with that because I see a lot of things that are like almost there, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have time to take them on immediately and do all that work. But there, you know, if my notes resonate and if it comes back, like that could be great. So I try and be generous on that kind of front. Like if I read anything, like if I've requested something and I, I read it, like I will try and be pretty specific with why I'm passing. And if I'm open, You're, I'm, generally there's a lot of people who I'm like, I'm really open to seeing your next thing. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I don't want, I'm not looking to shut doors you know, for people. Also, like, it might not be me, but maybe that note will be helpful and it will get them where they need to go. Well, to that end, so let's say you request something, the query was strong, it's up your alley, pages are good. At what point in reading do you typically know that you want to offer? Is is there like a magic moment or specific things that kind of like tip you over that edge? I mean, I have signs for myself. Like generally, like I have to want to tell somebody about the book mm. because I'm going to have to sell the book. So if I know I'm like... A, I mean, obviously, like, usually it's my husband because, like, that he's the only other adult in the house. Like, my five-year-old does not care. Uh, <laughs> Unless it's a picture book? <laughs> well, sometimes. Yeah, I show him picture books sometimes. And he's like, oh, mom, whatever happened to that thing? Um, mm -hmm. But mostly, if I tell, start telling somebody about it, like, if I bring it up on, an, on one of our weekly calls with my mm -hmm. agency or if I tell Stephen about it, like, usually that's a good sign because if I'm going to if I get excited about it, I want to tell somebody about it, then that'll make me a better salesperson for it when the time comes to shop it. I also really need to be, if I'm reading something, I'm like, oh, I would love to send this to such and such editor. That's a good sign too, because then it won't be hard for me to make that submission list when the time comes. Um, and also just if I really want to talk to the author at the end of reading the book. Like those are basically where it, what it comes down to for me. So we've talked about like what makes you like a book, auto-reject stuff. I also got a lot of questions from people because everyone's always nervous about the market, the, the elusive yeah. market. market. And so obviously as much as things are about fit, it's also about, it's literally your job to sell books. So 
how much do you consider saleability, marketability, market ability, and what do you do if you get a project and it's in a difficult to sell genre or dead genre, but you really like the book? I mean, a lot of it, you just got to go with your gut on. Um, nothing's a no all the time. Um, there are things that are just more challenging and some, thankfully, a lot of times the stuff that's really challenging is stuff I don't like anyway, like vampires. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I've never liked them when they were popular. I don't like them now. So probably it's not going to, like, mm -hmm. it's not an issue for me. Um, but it's like a never, it's not a never say never, you know, like you never say never, like otherwise. But you yeah. like dystopian. So that's actually a, I a good. I did. I liked dystopian before it was huge, actually. Like mm -hmm. the very first thing I sold was about a town where everyone was brainwashed to be perfect. Ooh. But I always love those kinds of concepts and yeah. like perf utopian, but just, you know, like, you know, mm -hmm. it was a modern book I that, that, that element to it. I always like stuff like that. Um, yeah, but it, it, we've seen so many variations of all those things that it's really hard to see one now and be like, well, what does this offer that we haven't already done a million times? I also mm -hmm. think that market has a lot to do with our reactions to the world around us. So up until now, people were saying fantasy was dead. And mostly because a lot got published in the last couple of years. Um, the tricky part of market is like, the adult world and the kids world work very differently from each other. Like in the adult world, fantasy is steady. Mm -hmm. Sci-fi is a steady, thriller is a steady. In YA, for whatever reason, people want thrillers and then they want sci-fi and then they want fantasy and it changes. And mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is like, those things are probably way more steady than the industry treats them, but yeah they've just like, because editors get tired of a certain kind of thing, like they declare them over or whatever, they've seen too much. Um, yeah. But it's necessarily true on the bookseller's end or the kid's end. It's just that they don't have what available to them. Um, so I don't know if, I actually really don't know if YH has a, ha, even has a healthy approach to market. Um, I don't think it does. I don't think that's that's like, like, yeah, I mean, I, I could yell into the wind about that one forever and I'll- like, Bye-bye. Right, like you know, like sci-fi. Obviously, we work together. But it works. Um, like, I mean, people still like it and read it. It just it's yeah. the bookstores have a hard time with it. The publicists have a hard time with it. The marketers have a hard time with it. But like, adult sci-fi people don't have a hard time with it, and they don't stop publishing it. So I don't know why we have such trouble with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just a thing. So anyway, I we were hearing like fantasy. Don't we can't sell a fantasy to save your life? I think the pandemic's going to upend that. Like my I completely, yeah. My prediction is that as soon as people's creative juices start flowing again, when they're less paralyzed from fear and quarantine, I think no one's going to want to read a realistic fiction novel to save their lives. I don't think anyone's going to want to read virus novels. I don't think anyone's, I think people are going to want to read something that's so different than where we've been. I think fantasy is going to be back. Like, Although my question, in, in contemporary, couldn't there possibly be like, very light rom-coms that would kind of fill well, but that. That's when people have been asking for that for a little yeah. while. So rom-com has had a resurgence in the last 12 months and people are continually asking for that, which is great. And they're asking for it in a broader way than they've ever asked for it before. So that's, I think that's going to stay. I think we're going to see a move, like I've read, you know, I've read critis literary criticism about this kind of thing for a while. Like I remember reading about it in college about like when Lord of the Rings movies came out um, in the early 2000s, like why we were having such a love affair with big high fantasy then. And people were pinning a lot of that on the Iraq war and like not, you know, the world situation being tenuous that everyone wanted allegory. And you could go back further to like World War II when Tolkien wrote the damn things. And like yeah. people wanted more of that, get me out of this universe. So like we look to things that are other and like you can, also look at when it's easier to track with movies and stuff like that too. Like when a lot of sci-fi movies are being made, when a lot of fantasy mm -hmm. movies are being yeah. made. Um, and is that a psychological cultural reaction to um, that? And yes, I think it is. So trying to wrap it up on a, you know, not so happy subject, but everyone's asking the question and you and I talk shop all the time. So, you know, I enjoy talking about the business. You enjoy talking about the business. So what do you think this whole pandemic situation, how is that going to impact the business side of publishing? You know, it's interesting because 
obviously like I'm listening to a lot of podcasts breaking down like what this has done to our society, what it's going to do to our schools. And I think like anything else, a, tra a big um, disaster can kind of show you where the weaknesses were before the disaster. Mm -hmm. So we, I think very quickly the industries realized the Amazon problem and the ebook problem. Mm -hmm. um, so with the lack of independent bookstores open, because the states have state home orders and Barnes and Noble having to shove, you know, close a lot of stores, like print sales are in danger. And that's one thing. And Amazon's like, we're not shipping books and we're not mm -hmm. even going to stock more books. So literally if you do a search for any kind of book on Amazon right now, they take you right to Kindle yep. results, which pisses me off. My ebook sales are up. Well, which is fine, but that's, so ebook sales are not up across the board. Yeah. Um, and I think we've seen that ebooks, ebooks had kind of plateaued for a while amidst the proportion of sales and print was still the dominant. Um, so I think audio and ebook, we expected to rise a little bit more, but they're not. Yeah. And partially I think the mentality of everyone who's stuck at home just doesn't have the bandwidth to read. Um, yeah. Like me, like, I, well, I mean, my yeah. audiobook consumption is up, but I'm not reading ebooks because I can't. I've been, I've been buying ebooks on sale and not reading them. I bought two ebooks books because my library holds expired. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can encourage anyone watching this. Like if you want to keep publishing alive, please, if you can afford it, like, mm. you know, keep buying ebooks if you can, it would help whatever. And if you can avoid shopping from Amazon forever from now on, that would be great too. Um, we've also seen some uh, good alternatives for shopping print books, like from bookshop.org, um, which is a good resource. And it's, you know, it's operated from the Ingram warehouse. So things are like, it's just, you can get anything at the same price that you could, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty quick shipping. Um, and that supports independent bookstores. Like, I think we've just seen more stark contrast to like that we need our physical bookstores. Um, there have been some weird supply chain issues coming out of this, like paper comes from China and mm -hmm. printing happens in China. So okay books are getting rescheduled, not because of sales, but because the printers don't have paper. So that's part of why things are getting more on the adult side than the children's side. But like picture books are going to have a hard time because they get printed in China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think like I had a thing happen where the publisher couldn't get a sample from China for a special box set. So it's not happening this year. Like oh. they missed the windows. So I think we're just going to see different shifts about what's working and what's not working and wh where we can even it out or not. So I think it'll be really interesting to see the royalty statement six months from now. Yeah. Period. The, on the plus side is that, you know, just going on like book scan or whatever, like there was a huge dip that first week after all the stay at home orders started. And then it did come back up a little bit again. So I do think people are still like their print sales are still happening. Um, but we have seen the fact that like pe the, bo the books that we're selling are st like the big hitters are still selling. Everybody else is kind of suffering because there's less visibility. Um, I don't know. I just think we're going to have a long haul to kind of bring it back up to speed again. Unfortunately, there have been layoffs at some publishers. I've lost a few editors that, you know, we liked that have now been laid off. Hopefully they'll have jobs to be hired for again when people can expand, but who knows? Um, books are still being sold, but, you know, the publishers have changed their payout structure. Oh, so yeah. like some publishers are like, usually you get a, port a half on signing of your contract. It's all getting pushed to um, publication or you know delivery, so you're getting less upfront because they're having they're the cash flow shuffling around their cash. Yeah, flow, and yeah. they kind of just get money to be coming out of their pockets later on. So I, it's interesting to see how it's going to shake out. I we'll see how fast we can get parts of society back up and running again. I personally have been like shopping, making sure to buy books on barnesandnoble.com and from mm -hmm. independents directly and from bookshop.org. Like I've purchased from all of them, so you know, that's a huge thing that people should really be doing if they want to keep stuff afloat. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I do think people have been a lot more innovative with online marketing and social media. So hopefully that kind of stuff can be helpful. We don't really know yet mm -hmm. how it's paying off. Yeah. So that's the basics. Like it's not good. Like this, re this recession is for everybody across the board Yeah. and it's not anybody's like, it's not the housing crisis. It's not anyone's fault. Like it's not anyone industry's fault. Like the bottom didn't fall out in one spot. It fell out 
everywhere. So we're just going to deal with, like, we're going to get hit with these ramifications just like everybody else. Yeah. It's just a matter of how we bounce back from it. Um, <sighs> hopefully it won't, you know, I mean, the good news for us is like, we're not a sporting, you know, we're not the sports, live sports. So it's yeah. like, as soon as bookstores can start to be open again. Yeah. And I, I think there will that back, come but, a time people will want the reading stuff will end. <laughs> and yeah, and I read at home. But like it'll be the time for escape yeah. reads. Even if so. we can't gather in groups of fifty or more for a long time, like hopefully enough bookstores can still open their doors to get the inventory going again. Yeah. Uh, everyone give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I will do more interview style videos and I might even be able to get Alana back to answer more questions in the future. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy writing. <laughs>